creative. I think that's really where you see the creativity sometimes. And, and an author. I think there are different kinds of plot twists, and you know, I, I think there's there's um you know kind of the sixth sense kind of plot twist that's something huge that changes that changes sort of what everything else in the movie up to that point means. Um, you know, and then there are plot twists, I think, in the sense of just having developments that are surprises and developments that, you know, challenge the characters and challenge the events. Um, I'm trying to think of something like, you know, the return of the king. Like, does that, does that have a twist? Like, I mean, it has, it has developments, it has drama, and it has tension, but I don't know that there's any point there where you, you, you know, read the book or see the movie and you think, oh, that, I never saw that coming. You know, this, this changes everything. But the return of the king was, was written. 60, 70 years ago also. Sure. So, I mean, m more recently, you're saying how fiction fans have, have shortened in years, so for more recent fiction, has there been books that don't utilize plot twists? By the way, that's homework right now, guys. Yeah, Everybody I, yeah, think of one more. I think you're right. Here. I think, I think, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw myself back to um, English literature class in high school. <laughs> and to be honest, okay, I'm not good and en good enough of a nerd to have liked that class. And I read like a fiend, especially back then. And I was bored out of my t out of my head because it's just it's all straightforward, and there wasn't a lot of a lot of changes. But you know, in the last 20 years, I think the whole industry has changed, and and we have different expectations of what a book or a movie does. I was just going to say that for me, like the most popular narrative right now that we see in any medium um, with tons of plot twists is Game of Thrones. And, you know, most people are surprised, like I watch popular media and stuff, and they're surprised by the reaction, or people are surprised at what happens in the show. But should you really be surprised um, knowing the environment? I mean, it's a wicked world they live in, and, you know, actually there should be more deaths at this point. I mean, I'm not completely aligned with everything on it, but like, I think, you know, if the environment within the novel, the setting within the novel, dictates a lot of chaos theory, then let it dictate a lot of chaos theory, so. All right, so let's, first of all, before we go into the actual craft of plot twists, let's talk about our favorite plot twists. You guys need a minute? Uh, I, you could have asked us beforehand to prepare. <laughs> oh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm so I'm ready. I'm ready. Good. Go ahead. Uh, Babadook, has anyone watched that? Great plot twist at the end. I'm not going to talk a spoiler bird or anything like that, but great plot twist, great small film carved out of horror and psychological trauma. Really, really good. So um, I don't really want to mention it because I don't think people have watched it. What's it called? Babadook. Babadook? Yeah, it's a horror movie with a children's book in it. It's great. Very atmospheric. I think one of my favorite recent plot twists, and I won't tell you what it is, but it shouldn't be a surprise that there is a twist, is the uh, White Bear episode of Black Mirror. Yeah? It's it's one of those plot twists. <laughs> yeah? Okay. okay. <laughs> I think you're the only one that's in, that, that's all that. It's, so it's, what I love about it is it's one of those twists that changes the meaning of everything else you've seen in the episode. Um, I think there are a lot of kinds of plot twists and some that you know, reflect on the characters, some that are sudden reversals. That's something you've been building up to the entire episode, and then when you get to when you get to the twist, it's like now everything that's happened means something completely different from what I thought. And I, I really enjoy kind of that elegance and just the sheer mind effery of that. Mm, I, th I think back in the 90s, uh, the crying game was a good example as far as the film medium with a good plot twist because. Uh, the studio came out and put in the, in, in, in the newspaper clippings, if you've seen this movie, please do not give away the ending. That's great marketing. It, it is. It was awesome. It was awesome marketing. And then everyone that went to see it, even in the trailer, they had no idea what was going on. But but it, it was a, it was a reversal with one of the characters. Who's seen that movie? I, I mean, it was, it was kind of shocking, especially in the 90s. So. I'm going to go on a much smaller scale and go with Kim Harrison's The Hollow series. And and you might go, well, yeah, there's a couple of plot twists in there, but if you start out with the beginning of the book, you know, the beginning of the series and go to the end and realize where they end up, there's some twists and turns, and especially not the, hey, did you know that these people are actually an option of these people, but it's what that means to their lives. And I like the how it affects the, the people and, and what that makes of their lives. 
I'm gonna give two quick examples. Um, the first one is Predestination. I don't know if you have seen it, and if you have seen it, it is a fan. Freaking fantastic movie. <laughs> I'm just I'm looking for kids that will. And then, and then the other one isn't so much a plot twist, but so much um, just a beautiful execution. Um, the very the third Kill Bill movie, yeah. when he just goes, I overreacted. You know, <laughs> and, 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 and at one point, every bad thing that he's ever done, you go like, oh, that kind of came out of love, and he was angry. Yeah, I'm the same thing too. And that's kind of how I felt, even though you know, and basically it's just it's a beautifully executed response. Uh, explain the entire movie. Yeah, if you're going to talk about beauty, I would go with Serenity. Because, mm -hmm. you know, all of a sudden, an entire series made sense. It's like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, since you're defining plot twists, is this plot twist like from the uh, audience perspective, or do plot twists from the characters? Ooh, I'm the only one who didn't know this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I feel like they're only really twists if they come as a surprise to the audience. I think kind of the dissonance between, like the information asymmetry between a reader and a character is tension, but it's not really a plot twist. I think that's valid. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I agree. What she said. <laughs> um, question. What about, uh, what about twists that only affect the perception of one character? Like some of my favorite um, elements of, of various books are when one character, the perception of a tertiary character, a secondary character, is turned completely like uh, Sirius Black in Harry Potter or um, in To Kill a Mockingbird or you know, things like that where it's just they, we have this preconceived notion and then the, the main character or the secondary characters kind of all of a sudden everything shifts for them, and that's always one of the most um, exciting things for me in a book. I mean, do you, would you consider that a plot twist or? I think so. I mean, yes. I like Chuck Lonick's uh, Fight Club. I mean, that was a really mm -hmm. yeah. plot twist, even for the character and the audience at the same time. Yeah, I think Sixth Sense, um, you know, Luke finding out that Darth Vader's his father. Spoiler! <laughs> Can you give me some spoiler warning? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think like those are things that come as a surprise to the audience, but what makes them meaningful is that you know they're going to change a lot for the character as well. And the character's going to have to reevaluate something about herself or is going to have to make new decisions going forward. And oftentimes it spurs a new course of action. And so that gives you a, a new trajectory for the entire narrative. Yeah, I think the majority of the plot twists we mentioned from popular media have all had a hearty amount of exposition before them. Um, they're not like out of nowhere or anything. Um, a really good plot twist, and I'm going to jump back because I was an English major to my English class nerd. It was uh, Rose for Emily, if you guys read that short story by William Faulkner. Um, that sets a standard for a lot of plot twists, I think. I mean, it's very small story and it's like a thousand words, but check it out. Um, do you think that the audience's knowledge of plot twists and expectations of them will make it so that the absence of a twist is a twist? Jack, why don't you get on with that? <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, there's, there's tons of films where you're like, that's it? I, and and that, that is a twist on itself. But is that a good twist? <laughs> well, it, it's, it's subjective. You know, it's, it's uh, everyone's, you know, open to their own opinion. I mean, that's it. it, it it's, it's your own expectation of what you want from it. I think, I don't think this is exactly what you're talking about, but I think one thing that is kind of interesting is that um, there are certain kinds of twists that you know just sort of get built up by this momentum, and when you when you reach them at the end, you realize the book or the movie told you from the beginning that this was what was going to happen, and you didn't believe it because you thought things were going to get better. Um, Brazil is a good example of that. Uh, there are a few others that I I want to be careful about naming because I don't want to spoil them. Um, we generally have a one or two year rule here. Yeah. At All right, so fair if, enough. If it's been more than two years. Bad on you for not seeing it. <laughs> yeah. And me too, because I don't see a lot of them. So the game, wool, like all 
these, all of these books and movies, they tell you what's happening in the world and they tell you where things are going. And there's this moment for a long time when you think something else is happening and then you get to the end and you realize, oh, that's what was going on. And they said that. Um, so it's, it's still a surprise, but it feels like it shouldn't be when you get there. Uh, American you, he was dead at the beginning. He told you he was dead. Mm -hmm. Same thing. In the back. Uh, kind of in there, actually. Let me go in the back first. Um, can we talk about plot twist by finding out we have an unreliable narrator? Um, and either, well, either a naive narrator or an unreliable, intentionally deceptive point of view. I love when the narrator is not the protagonist. That's that's fascinating, I have to admit, but someone else do you want to take go forward? I think you know, I think one of the rules about plot twists is you can't generally have your point of view character leave out something that they wouldn't leave out just to surprise a reader. But I think what makes but unreliable narrators are a lot of fun, but I think they fall into two categories. Um, oftentimes they're telling the story to someone else. So you have, you have the usual suspects, you have Heart of Darkness, you have, I think Deceiver is the Tim Roth movie? Well, anyway, they're, they're telling the story to somebody else. And so when you find out that something was left out, you see why. Um, or the other option, I think, is you have somebody who has a, a condition or a situation where the fact that they are leaving something out makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think that's like American Psycho, um, Brazil, uh, and a few other things where it's like, oh yeah, well, the whole point is you don't even, six sense, like you don't even realize what's going on. So how could you have told me that? But yeah, I think with unreliable narrators, you usually have to choose one or t one of those two delivery methods in order for it to feel fair to spring that twist on the audience at the end. None of those Agatha Christie things where, well, I told you to go look into the train schedule. <laughs> no, that you're just leaving things out then. <laughs> One um one novel that has a really great unreliable narrator in it is Grendel by John Gardner, which is the opposite point of view of the Beowulf story. And um, that one, you have a hard time trusting Grendel, but he's so eloquent, you kind of want to trust him. So it kind of all depends on voice, really, if they're reliable or not. Okay. Um, kind of in the same vein as the previous previous question, have, has there ever, have you ever encountered a plot twist where you see it coming, but you didn't want it? Do you have something in mind? Um, the ending, uh, we haven't talked much about video games, uh, but the ending of the Bioshock the video game, mm -hmm. I saw the plot twist coming, but I'm like, no, no, no. And then it happened, and then I had my heart go. All of Game of Thrones. I, <laughs> I will say that I stopped left. reading yeah. it because my heart got torn apart too many times and I finally gave up and I can't do this. It's that good. I think you have a question here. Yeah, um, I would say, wouldn't an example of a plot twist that's not a plot twist kind of be when either the series has conventions or the genre has conventions and then the person like normally, like the beats of the story, the audience is aware of, and then the person like takes the beat that's supposed to be a twist. And maybe, I'm, I'm thinking of like, like a Buffy episode where the demon turns out not to be a demon, it's just it's a person, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, it's a nice demon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Misunderstood. Is that, a lack, is that a lack of a twist, or is that like a double twist? <laughs> that sounds like a double twist. It sounds like a double twist. I like it. It's, it's, it's yeah. like a hat on a hat. You know, and, and, and um, that, that in itself is a twist. You know? Yeah, it's a good plot twist. Uh, Gentleman Carback? Uh, yeah, I was wondering uh, what your thoughts were on not necessarily plot twist, but more like a character twist. For example, uh, this, the story of Sleeping Beauty and the movie Maleficent, where a character like painted evil Neely because she wears black, or you know, she's supposedly out for this revenge. But in reality, we're not told the whole story from Sleeping Beauty's point of view. Like, would that be more of a character twist, or would that also be a fun twist? That's almost a little bit about the, the the narrator being, you know, just telling it from their point of view, and then you come to find out, oh, well, they're missing a few things that are important here. So, from a writing standpoint, do you feel like you can take any plot development and craft it into a twist, or are there certain features that you need in order to make it twisty? 
That's a really good question. That's a great question. Yeah. Stories for you. Um, well, for me, I can't take any situation and have a plot twist in it. Like, I write about apocalyptic setting is what I write about mostly. That has plenty of twists, of course. Um, so I can't take any situation, unfortunately. Um, sometimes the straight truth about everything is, is interesting because I write a lot of nonfiction too, but my fiction, I need to have it in an environment where things can, things can be unpredictable, or else I'm bored as a writer. Um, I need to be able to change things as I'm writing it too. Yeah, I think it's something you definitely have to prepare for. Like you have to, you know, you have, you have to build up to it so that when you get there it has weight. And it's not just like, oh, well that thing happened and that's surprising, but it doesn't really, you know, change anything for anybody. Um, it, it has to have weight and you have to, you have to signal for it just enough so that when you get there you think, okay, well that's fair, you know, the, the writer, the storyteller told me, you know, they, they set this up and where it went made sense. Um, I think though a lot of interesting twists come from when you, when you take something that is something that is normally a rule of storytelling or an unofficial rule of storytelling and you break it, like you know, not killing children and you know not giving your main characters meaningless deaths, and I think that's what surprised a lot of people about the first season and the first book of the Game of Thrones series. Um, you know, it was like that's you don't kill your main characters that way, but he did, and that's why it felt like a twist. Why was it a twist? Yeah, it's about laying the tracks. I mean, you you, you can't just. Uh, can't just spring something on it. I, and if it feels forced, your audience is going to pick that apart and melt right away. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's an unwritten mm -hmm. Although I will say that I'll be writing something, and you know, I've got the general outline in my head, and secondary is something going on, and all of a sudden I surprise myself. It's like, oh, really? Because that's not where I was going. How did that get on the page? I don't know. Hey, if it if it works for me and, and, and it makes me interested, then I'm gonna bank on somebody else being interested on it too. Mm -hmm. um, did you have questions still? Um, I had one uh, where <laughs> I think I'm not sure if you would have had any experience with this, but I think my favorite um, kind of plot twist has been kind of the intentional fool, where the, the protagonist is doing something all along and they, they always seem like a, a bumbling idiot or they just get themselves into the shit pardon my language and you know at the, at the end of the, the story you know it turns out that this was their plan all along and you feel like the secondary characters with that just that smack in the face shock um <clears throat> first example that comes to my mind is the thief by megan Wayne turner um so i'm, I'm just like, wondering would you have any idea of, of like other mediums or other <coughs> series that would have that kind of setup? Get smart. Lucky number seven. Dirty rotten scoundrel. Awesome. Any high school movies? Yeah, dragon. Grab you next time. Kind of the previous topic about trying to make your twist feel authentic, you've got to kind of lay that track. Mm -hmm. um, do you fret about revealing too much or that maybe you haven't done enough? How do you, do you feel like you hit the balance and not go too far one way or the other? Yeah, you know, let's, let's talk about each of your individual processes and how you kind of lay the breadcrumb towards your blood plot twist. What, what's your techniques? How, how do you plan everything out? Okay. Um, mm -hmm. For me, I. Oh, geez. I just, I literally, literally, literally try to put my perspective and my character's perspective, because it's all first person, so. Um, the plot twists and stuff, they're all like a method of discovery for the character, obviously. And the breadcrumbs I leave are just like, the most minute details possible. Um, like, like, like when I read the Diaries book, um, these monsters come out at night, and then during the day the character appears safe, but there's something in the mirrors, um, in the setting, there's. You can't really look in mirrors at all, actually, as the story progresses. But um, the detail of the mirror, what's in the mirror, is never really discussed or completed because he doesn't want to look at the mirror very long. Because in his point of view, he can't just stare at a monster in a mirror because he'll be killed. So it's stuff like that. It, it really is what the physical interaction the character would have with the environment. That's what just determines the plot twist for me and how I lay the breadcrumbs. So. I find that I discover my twists usually fairly late in the planning process, and sometimes even when I'm already writing. Um, because for me, they come about as sort of this natural progression of things that are already happening in the world, and things that the characters are doing, 
and you know, as I'm asking myself these questions about, well, where is this all headed, and like, what would you know, what would make this more meaningful? What's something that would like utterly crush this character or force this person to really rethink things? Um, and it's, you know, it's either once I've got pretty much everything laid out, um, or it's you know, as I'm writing and I'm kind of working to that character's climax, and I see. Oh, that's where they're going, and you know, I, I see where that's where that's been built up all along. Um, but I definitely find that it's helpful to have beta readers and critique partners to you know kind of say, well, yeah, this came as a surprise, or no, you tipped your hand a little too much. Don't you love it when your character is surprised to you? <laughs> that is the best thing in the world, honestly. I just love it. I'm sorry. I'm just excited about it. <laughs> Um, I, I do it unconventionally. I, when, I, when I start a project, I, I first put my, my uh, thinking cap on as far as you know, what, what's going to make an audience want to point down their money to go and see this film. And then, and then secondly, I, I think about the actors and what's going to want them to commit to, to starring in this film. And then I, I construct uh, the film based around the actual plot twist before I structure the film up. So I, 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 I write down the actual plot twist, and then I start developing the film around it, and then I, I go in and start writing the script. That way the plot twists are inherent to the film, and they're not just thrown in. And that way the breadcrumbs are, are already you know, laid within the tracks of the, of the film itself. And that way, when I have to go in and rewrite for the, uh, the producers and stuff, there, there are no plot holes, and it seems to be easier. That's beautiful. <laughs> I don't do it anyway like that, but obviously I'm not ready for for film either. Um, I, I'm I'm going to share. I'm a gardener, and I, I write like a gardener because you know you put the stuff in because you know where you're going. You have your general outline, and you do it, and then you come back and you look at it later and go, hmm, that's kind of lopsided, and that. And so it's like okay, I'm going to put a little here, and and essentially I'm always kind of adjusting things. As, as I go, so it's it's a multi-phased approach. And then somebody else comes and reads it and goes, you know, you get it wrong. Oh, okay, let's talk about that. Um, question? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, still like to hear what you guys thought was the worst plot twist ever. Yeah. That was my <laughs> next question. Kind of related to that is, um, one of the big ways plot twists tend to fail in today's culture is the idea of the writer didn't know what was happening, didn't see it coming, and just, you know, pulled it out of their butt, you know, there was the old Battlestar Galactica meme where the ratings are down for an episode, let's twirl the spinner and find out who's a Cylon today. <laughs> <laughs> what, what other ways do you think deflate a good plot twist from succeeding? Okay, so we've got a two-part question here. What, what are the bad plot twist, or that, give an example of a bad plot twist, and what prevents one from, and what was the second part, sir? What, def, what, are, what are some other ways that deflate, deflate a good plot twist from happening? Okay, well, bad plot twist, I, spoiler alert or whatever, um, The Village, <laughs> my god, I was all, I was so hyped up about that movie, I thought, like, M. Night Shyamalan had found some, like, great Irish myth about these monsters in the woods that human beings had a really, like, mapped out relationship with. And all of a sudden, there are other human beings who are causing problems. I mean, that was just stupid. Um, and and for me, um, what ruins a good plot twist is uh, making it. Uh, I guess I'll use the village too predictable, you know, or like making it. Um, sometimes you want it to be a sense of escapism, a plot twist. You don't want it to be grounded in our reality. And monsters in the village would have been great, um, but that's not what happened. Because who doesn't like monsters in your village? Mm -hmm. I guess maybe one of my least favorites was Unbreakable, another M. Night Shyamalan movie. Just I just always remember the, the quiet Samuel Jackson moment where he goes, I'm Mr. Glass. Yeah. And I, I don't know, it just, it felt kind of weak to me, and it was kind of like, oh, that's where we're going? I don't know. Um, that one was a letdown for me. I think, you know, I think some twists become so common that they become tropes of their own. And like one is the, so-and-so is dead, but not really. You know, and then so and so is actually related to so and so. I think those things can still work though, as long as they're in the service of something larger. Like as long as that's not the aha moment, as long as it's you know part of a bigger twist or part of a bigger development, and they don't, you know, the writer doesn't try to treat that as the big reveal. Um, I think those can still work. Uh, 
menacing signs. Brutal for M. Night today. Here's the thing, M. Night's gotten into trouble with, with the industry because like uh, the village, he lost his Disney contract because they had to settle out of court with uh, Scholastic because he plagiarized a children's book called Running Out of Time. Yeah. I mean, down to oh, wow. the book cover had a young girl with a red cloak, and it was the same exact premise of this entire film. And they paid, Disney paid Scholastic and the author like $15 million. Nice. And then, and then, I mean, the sixth sense, he borrowed, I mean, he, he basically ripped off Richard Matheson's Stir of mm -hmm. and, and that was the same premise of the sixth sense. And the ending of Signs, he, he used water as that, you know, about the girl <laughs> putting cups of water all over, and he borrowed uh, an element of Stir of Echoes, the actual book about the kid being scared of feathers, you know, and, you know, it's, it's in, in David Cohen, has said repeatedly, who wrote Stir and directed Stir Back, he goes, I don't know why Emily keeps borrowing material from <laughs> So, But I did like Unbreakable. I think that was his most original thing. Yeah. I'm going to go with the, the one that Disney has granted you, you know the canon, so you think you kind of know what's coming, but it was. You were using, you know, semaphore to really, you know, like an hour in to tell it into darkness. I was like, seriously, was there ever a surprise in that movie? No. Um, but I would also say 2010, only because it's bad science. <laughs> if you're going to have a plot twist, don't use bad science. Um, I can't believe any of you guys, none of you guys said this, but um, lost. <laughs> The polar bear. Um, yeah, the polar bear, the snake monster, the others. God. I mean, I mean that, that is an example of good plot twists that were used very poorly. Mm -hmm. Because they, they were throwing plot twists at you, but they never gave you the explanation behind anything. So, yeah. I'm done with that. <laughs> uh, can we push in the back, can we push in the back first? It's pure desperation. <laughs> you, all, you know, a lot of people, you know, you don't have a lot of time, and, and you're trying to do a lot of things, and so you need something to tell you early on whether you're going to be interested in them, in, in the book, and so I'm a fan of a hook, but not necessarily the you know, 10 minutes in there, we have a firefight and then a, you know, that kind of scripted thing. But I'm, I'm a fan of the hook, and maybe it's just because I'm a, you know, lazy. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't need to be an anchor, like, jabbed into you, but a hook's fine. <laughs> like, yeah, it, I mean, I think, what was it, seven seconds that was our attention span now? Yeah. So there has to be somewhat of a hook, unfortunately. <laughs> I've never read I it. wish someone had taken a hook to it. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of times those hooks, um, more than being tw plot twists, they're sort of the beginning of a mystery. Like it sets up a question for you, and you keep going because you want to answer that question. Or it just sets something up about the character that goes, oh, well this sounds interesting. I'm, you know, it's, it's no Madame Bovary. Going back to the literature. <laughs> uh, Jack talked about the timing in screenwriting. Is there a timing sequence in novels as well? Is it too early, too late? Or will there make a difference in the story? I, I don't plot or an outline, outline for my novels. I'm one of those people that's pulling that out of my butt as I go, no. Um, but like, I, I think there's a certain time. I think you have hit a level of ex exposition or whatever character development you feel like you need to kind of jazz things up. I mean, you're cons I mean we're all here because we're writers and we produce things because we care about our audience and want to have an audience. So we do eventually change the tempo of the beat. I mean, I feel like there are a lot of sort of classic structures that people look at for writing, and I think like the seven-part structure is a really common one, but 
I guess I'd say that kind of the rules for pacing your twists and for setting up your novel are probably a bit looser. And I think some of that is because it's assumed, I think that readers have a longer attention span than viewers do. Um, and also because there's not usually quite as much money writing on a novel as there is, you know, on, on an episode or, you know, a movie that costs millions of dollars to make. And so you can take a few more risks and you accept that people are gonna be comfortable with those, you know, those risks. Oh, I'm supposed to answer about books. I, I, you read, don't you? Oh yeah, I do. Read. I, 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 I think I think books have the luxury of, of taking as much time as they need to. You know, uh, good books uh, like uh, I, I mean, going back to, to like uh, even Watership Down. I mean, that was yeah. that was a, a, a decent book when I was a kid. I remember it was it was pretty thrilling, but it took time to uh, get to know like. Uh, uh, Hazel and, and Bigwig and, and those rabbits, you know, and, and I thought that was pretty cool. And, and that kept my attention span when I was in fifth grade. So I agree. I think I think reading is more sort of a self-discovery. You know, you're it's just you and the book, and you're on you're on this journey together. Oh, it's not so good. Um, as opposed to being in a theater, a bunch of people who are like, okay, I got this much time. Come on. mysteries have to end with some sort of twist you know like because that you know part, you're you're waiting the whole time to see who did it or why did they do it and if you know that at the whole time you're going through then you know you kind of lose that reward at the end and part of what's engaging about a mystery is that you're always guessing um and you know you're, you're looking for the clues and you're you know you feel intrigued a little bit challenged and if that element isn't there i don't think most mysteries really work except colombo Columbo. You always know who did it, right? Mm -hmm. He's watching the dog and the dog. That's true. Well, that's also more of a comedy. So there you go. Yeah, but it was the process. And there was always a twist. Yes, and it was usually the twist for the suspect, not not for the the detective. Okay. Yes, I'm very much interested in the, uh, the, the relationship between plot and subtext. Uh, one writer told me that, that, that if you use the subtext very ex extensively, you don't need a plot. Interesting. If you use the subtext extensively, you don't need a, you don't need a plot twist? Or, or or plot twist. Yeah. I think you always need a plot. Otherwise, what's the yeah. route? Yeah. Well, and, and as an actor, I mean, you're always working in subtext. But your subtext might be at odds with actually where the plot is going. Because you're just, the subtext is, is character driven, I think, unless we have a different um, definition of subtext. Well, Patrick Rothfuss's novella. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I would say that, that is an example of something that pushes the borders of lack of plot in, in a way because it's got a lot of subtext behind it and it kind of carried the, the story along. Anybody agree or disagree? Does it, was it, it a good book? Shorter? Plus, it, it was a short book though. Yeah. It was a very short book. It was short. <laughs> 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 well, I, I, I think it's important to note that Patrick Rothfuss wrote a novella and it was a short It was the shortest $18 book I've ever bought. <laughs> <laughs> It, it wasn't no bummer. But 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 that doesn't still hurt. It's a show of words card from my Do you ever find that uh, the subtext or the, the, the character twists interfere or conflict with the plot twist? Uh, like for example, the Big Lebowski, there are a lot of plot twists, but the character remains um, kind of irritatingly the same. Like what happens <laughs> 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 A loser into the hero, guess what? He's still a loser. <laughs> now that's the plot twist. That's the anti plot twist, yeah? Yeah. He's adaptable. Yeah. He just does his thing and, and life goes on. You know, and he gets his blood back. But the, you know, that's, a good, that's a good point, and, and you did touch on it earlier, and that, but that's a reason why it can be 
kind of really interesting is, is the genre has you set up to expect a certain thing, and then nothing continues to happen, and that's your plot twist. I think it's, you know, we, when we talk about character arcs, I think we usually assume that it's about somebody changing or adapting in the face of adversity, but there is a character arc that's about someone struggling to remain the same in the face of adversity, and I think a lot of times when you have a straight man kind of character, you know, there's all this wackiness going on around them, but Michael Bluth is always Michael Bluth. Um, and that's, it's part of the comedy, and it's part of what makes that character's journey interesting, too. It's like uh, Mel Gibson and Payback. He never changes. I mean, even when his ex-wife dies of a heroin overdose, all he does is want his 70,000 bucks back, you know, and he <laughs> takes down the whole syndicate, and then he's still the same character at the end. That's it. I was just wondering, are there any, like, do you have any, like, plot twists where you, like, you read them and you're, like, this is a terrible plot twist and I really like it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like, you watch, like, an end night shot and you're like, yes, the alien side of water. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Bad plot twists that you really like. Let's <laughs> <laughs> go down the line. That's a tough one. Um, jeez. You know, I can't. Really think of any on the top of my head. Um, you know, I kind of, I, you know, the guy yeah, science is a good example, I guess. Why not? It's, you know, water. Yeah, they came to a planet that's covered in water. Blah blah blah. Um, but yeah, it, fine. It worked. It worked for me. And like, there were signs from the afterlife or whatever was happening. You know, he loses his metaphor, his allegory, um, in in his uh, pacing of the film and stuff. But. Um, that's one I, I was fine with. It was, didn't bother me as much as The Village, but like... <laughs> <laughs> I actually like The Village all right. See, this is from the client now. I think part of it is like, I, I'm normally the person who doesn't guess the twist, and so when I got to a point late in the movie where I thought, I think this is what's happening, what's happening, I thought, ooh, I got it, I'm smart. And so I, I appreciated that it, you know, it gave me a little pat on the back. <laughs> You know, maybe maybe Tim Burton's uh, Planet of the Apes. I, oh yeah, you know that, that that was an interesting film. It, it's like such good actors. You have Paul Giamatti and, and Tim Roth, and then you get to the ending and you're like, wow, how did this fail so miserably? And, and it's like uh, it was weird. You know, I, I remember seeing that in what 2001 or 2000 when that came out, and I'm like, I I don't get it. But, it's like a magnificent failure, that exactly. one. Yeah. Yeah. Mark Wahlberg? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That one. <laughs> <laughs> I wiped it out of my psyche. Yeah, wiped it out of their mouth. Thanks a lot. I'm going to go with one that I think is, on the face of it, is just horrible. And I'm going to go outside of science fiction. I apologize. Mm -hmm. Clue. Wow. That was a horrible. No, I mean, on paper, those are horrible plot twists. I mean, if you're just going to go, and this happens, you go, oh, get out of here. Let's watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> They're horrible, and I love it. I love every single freaking minute of that movie. Yes. Um, don't get me started on the acting. It's so it's good. Awesome. Oh, it's great. so good. Mm -hmm. um, I, I play a lot of able doctor playing games, uh, both running and playing it myself. A, you guys game it all. B, you have your advice for writing I always wanted to. I, yeah. <laughs> I play Heroes of New Earth and League of Legends, and I have no control of any of the characters. <laughs> yeah. I've been in a Pathfinder campaign with some people at work for about a year, and we're starting up a Numenera campaign. Um, but I'm not the GM because I just want to roll with it. Um, yeah, no, no, I, I think flexibility is a big thing, you know, like you have to you have to see where the players are going, where their characters are going, and, you know, kind of be ready to adapt to what they're doing. Um, one thing I've noticed is that, you know, we have different play styles, and some of it play very straight. And then we've got a guy who's one of the frog people whose name is Friesus, 
and he is a self-appointed prophet, um, and he wants to baptize everything with water and poison. So, you know, like, he's very different from, you know, the paladin defender who's really just trying to make sure none of us die. Uh, but, you know, our, our GM has to keep those different personalities in mind when she's plotting out our next disaster, so. This is kind of off topic, but I still think the greatest plot twist, I don't do um, tabletop gaming or anything, right? I mean, I play video games, I'm huge. I was a huge Squaresoft Final Fantasy fan growing up. But um, when Aerith dies in Final Fantasy VII, I think it's still probably my favorite plot twist from a video game. Um, I hope that doesn't ruin it for anyone, or if anyone plays those games anymore. Oh yeah, that's right, it is getting remade, why? I, well, actually, if you play it now, you're like, yeah, I know why. <laughs> I always wanted to when I was a kid. Yeah, uh, I, this I, is a dangerous I, crowd, I, but I don't game either. And, and don't judge me for that, okay? <laughs> I, I just read a lot. I can't judge you. All, all we had was an Atari growing up. We didn't have much fun. Yeah, my parents would never would never spend the money on that. And I think once you get toward past a certain point in your life, you just you don't get in the habit of it. It's a habit I wish I had gotten, but now I'm like, uh, good yeah, stuff. Yeah, I got a garden. My, my sister always wanted a Cabbage Patch Kit. She's older than me you now. My parents couldn't afford one at Christmas time, and I got her a cauliflower patch kit. She was, she was miserable. <laughs> so it's it came in a big plastic cauliflower, too. I've seriously never heard of that before. Oh, yeah. So related sort of to not having control over what the reader chooses, choose your own adventure books. Those are awesome. Are they? <laughs> yeah. But like structurally, you know, how do you really kind of approach a story style like that, which I feel is kind of underutilized in some ways in some modern, like more experimental, more adult novels sometimes too. But like choose your adventure. How do you work that sort of plot twist in when it's all plot twist, sort of? Is it great question though? Isn't that like on the game where you have the character choose your adventure? Yeah, I'd say, I guess like the closest experience I have is writing dialogue branches for RPGs. Um, you know, you, you kind of, I guess you have to anticipate like, because you can't go, you can't go crazy. You have to anticipate like what's a reasonable number of, you know, responses to this prompt. You know, like what are, what options are possible um, and what are the things that a few different personality types might really want to do. Um, I think it's actually kind of liberating sometimes to do that because rather than having to commit to one very specific storyline, you can have a bit more flexibility and say, well, maybe this happens and then maybe that happens. And, you know, it sort of lets you try out a little bit of everything. I like that. It's, it's for the commitment phobic writer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. I think choose your own adventures take more because you have to have several different elements. I, I think they're do they, cool. do they still make those kind of books? I, I oh, don't yeah. know. I remember when I was in school. They, they just started redoing them on, uh, on uh, e-readers and stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Last question over there. Okay, so you've talked about the necessity of plot twists in different kinds of storytelling. You talked about Game of Thrones and Lost and mysteries that are chock full of plot twists. What, do you think that there's a point of saturation where readers and, and viewers just get so um, desensitized to it that it's not shocking anymore? Jamie. And as a writer, how do you avoid doing that in your own work? Well, yeah, I think we're almost at that point. Um, I mean, sometimes it's hard to watch Game of Thrones or read Game of Thrones and you're like, oh God, I can't get attached to anything. Um, but I think as a writer, um, you know, you do want to kind of throw the audience a bone and at least keep something there um, for them to hold on to, for them to identify with, especially for metaphorical interpretation. Um, but yeah, I think I think we're really close to that saturation point, I'd say. I think it sort of comes back to why you're doing the plot twist. Like, you know, you said to, if you're just having a plot twist just because you think that's what needs to be there, then it's going to feel shallow and it's going to feel like, well, I just kind of added this on so that, ooh, you have your surprise. Um, I think I think they become important, you know, they become important where they serve the story and where they raise the stakes for the characters. And so I think if you're, you know, if what you're doing is not looking for a place to have a twist, but rather looking for the changes and the developments uh, that are really going to mean a lot for the world and the characters you're writing, that's where I think they stay fresh. Uh, 
I think within film, uh, studios are trying a bunch of different approaches right now. Who, who saw the new Terminator movie this week? Anybody? The new what? Terminator Genesis. Alan Taylor, who directed a bunch of Game of Thrones episodes, he, he did a great job directing it. And uh, they, they had some great plot twists in there. And the studio, I don't know who was in charge of marketing, uh, but they revealed all the Awesome pops within, within the, the third trailer. And there were, there were even articles this week where Alan Taylor was like, you know, I, I didn't have a final cut on that trailer, and we're not sure exactly why they revealed, you know, what was going on within the movie. But that would have been a shocking moment for audiences where in the 80s, had the movie come out, you know, we wouldn't have seen what was going on. And, and I, I think, you know, I, I think studios are really nervous about, you know, again, if a movie doesn't perform opening weekend, like Jurassic World and, and The Hunger Games, they're dead in the water. And they wanted to get as much information out as possible to audiences to make them want to go and see it. Here, we're going we're to give them the whole cow now and hope they go, but they, they didn't show up. And, and unfortunately, the, the film isn't performing as well as expected. And uh, they, they gave away the whole movie. Right? But I, I, I recommend going to see it because it's a fun play. You know? I think you're right. I think, I think you can do it too much. And I think sometimes they, it's going the way of um, the car chases and the gunfights, where it's like you get so saturated, you just tune it out. And then you, you leave the movie or in the book and you go, I'm tired. <laughs> well, e even critics are reviewing stuff. I mean, books to, to films to TV series, and they're giving everything away. And I mean, you as an audience, me as an audience, I'm like, what's the point of watching or reading it now? I know what's going to happen at the end of Gone Girl or whatever. I didn't read the book, but I, I saw the film because David Fincher directed it. But it's like, you know, I know what's going to happen. You know, it's, it, it's like when I was reading Fight Club, you know, for the first time before the movie came out, you know, that was cool and unexpected, but I didn't know what was happening. But I, I think we're at a different point in time where audiences need to know all this information right now, and the plot twists are being given away. I think Please. the studios think we need to know. Exactly. I, it's, it's one of those, people are so stupid <laughs> that unless they know it's really exciting, they won't come, and it's like, mm -hmm. From a, from a writing perspective, um, a plot twist is like any other tool you have in your writing box, like like action scene, like like a love scene, like a sex scene. Uh, why do cliffhanger? I want to do the cliffhangers too, which we didn't get to. But um, so it's one of those things where you want to use it judiciously with at, at the right time. If you use it too much, then you know readers do come numb to it. But we are out of time. Um, thank you all for being here for the part of the plot twist. And, uh, Enjoy the rest of your convergence and I'll uh, see you guys in the cabana tonight. <laughs>